Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 67, for broadcast on the 25th of August, 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, direct from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Spacetime is also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world through TuneIn Radio. Coming up on Spacetime, diamonds raining on Neptune and Uranus, large distant comets more common than previously thought, and the impact winter from the dinosaur killing asteroid could have thrust Earth into two years of darkness. All that and more coming up on Spacetime. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists have created diamond rain during experiments mimicking the conditions deep inside the giant ice planets Uranus and Neptune. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, represent the first time diamond rain has been created in the laboratory under the sorts of extreme pressures and conditions likely to occur inside the solar system's ice giants. Extremely high pressure squeezes hydrogen and carbon found in the interior of these planets to form diamonds, which then slowly sink down further into the interior. The glittering precipitation has long been hypothesized to arise more than 10,000 kilometers below the swirling cloud tops marking the visible surface of Uranus and Neptune, which are both similar in size and mass. The interiors of both these worlds are also thought to be similar. Both contain solid cores surrounded by a dense slush of different ices. On the ice giants in our solar system, the term ice refers to hydrogen molecules connected to lighter elements such as oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Researchers simulated the environments found inside these planets by creating shockwaves in plastic with an intense optical laser at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in California. In the experiment, the authors were able to see that nearly every carbon atom in the original plastic was incorporated into small diamond structures up to a few nanometers wide. On Uranus and Neptune, the authors predicted that diamonds would become much larger, maybe even a few million carats in weight. Researchers also think that over a few thousand years, it's possible the diamonds slowly sink through the planet's ice layers, eventually assembling into a thick layer around the planetary core. The study's lead author, Dominic Krauss, says the new observations were able to finally confirm previous assumptions. Earlier experiments attempting to recreate diamond rain in similar conditions couldn't capture real-time measurements because of the extreme conditions under which the tiny diamonds formed. The authors, therefore, only obtained fleeting hints of carbon forming graphite or diamond at lower pressures and with other materials introduced in altering the reactions. However, the use of new high-energy optical lasers and femtosecond X-ray pulses lasting just a quadrillionth of a second allowed the scientists to unambiguously observe high-pressure diamond formation and directly measure the chemical reaction for the first time. In the experiment, plastic simulates compounds formed from methane, a molecule with just one carbon atom bound to four hydrogen atoms. It's what causes the distinct blue colour we see on Neptune. The team studied a plastic material, polystyrene, that's made from a mixture of hydrogen and carbon and key components in these planets' overall chemical makeup. In the intermediate layers of the ice giants, methane forms hydrocarbons, that is the hydrogen and carbon chains that were long hypothesized to respond to high pressure and temperatures in deeper layers, resulting in the formation of diamond rain. The authors used high-powered optical lasers to create pairs of shockwaves in the plastic with the correct combination of temperature and pressure. The first shockwave is slower and smaller and is overtaken by the stronger second shockwave. As the two shockwaves overlap, pressure peaks 
and that's when most of the diamonds form. It was during these moments that the authors were able to probe the reaction with pulses of the brightest X-rays on Earth, but lasting just 50 femtoseconds, allowing them to see the small diamonds being formed. The technique is known as femto X-ray refraction, and it provides X-ray snapshots showing the size of the diamonds and details of the chemical reactions taking place. The falling diamond rain could also be an additional source of energy, generating heat while sinking towards the core. And research that compresses matter like in this study will also help scientists understand and improve fusion experiments, where forms of hydrogen combine to form helium in the process generating vast amounts of energy. It's the same process which powers the sun and other stars, but it's yet to be realised in a commercial application for power generation on Earth. In some fusion experiments, a fuel of two different forms of hydrogen is surrounded by a plastic layer that reaches conditions similar to the interior of planets during a short-lived compression stage. Therefore, the ice giant experiments on plastic now suggest that chemistry may be playing an important role in this stage. The reality is, simulations don't really capture what scientists are observing in this field. And so the data from this study provides evidence that matter clumping in these types of high-pressure conditions is a significant factor. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new study has warned that there are far more large long-period comets out there than previously thought. The findings reported in the Astronomical Journal are based on observations by WISE, NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer spacecraft. Comets are icy bodies that usually orbit the Sun on highly elongated orbits, swooping in from the dark outer reaches of the solar system beyond Jupiter before swinging around the Sun and shooting back out again. Comets that take over 200 Earth years to complete one of these orbits are referred to as long-period comets but they're notoriously difficult to study because they spend so much of their time far from Earth in the inner solar system. In fact, many long-period comets will never approach the inner solar system, quietly spending their lives out beyond Neptune among the frozen debris and icy worlds of the Kuiper Belt, where so-called trans-Neptunian objects like Pluto reside. Most comets are thought to be the leftover building material from the construction of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago, while others are likely interstellar bodies, caught up in the Sun's gravitational field and now travelling through the galaxy with the solar system. The more distant of these frozen worlds are categorised into a hypothetical Oort cloud, surrounding the solar system beyond the Kuiper belt and extending halfway to the nearest neighbouring star system. Science's best estimates indicate there must be many tens of thousands of comets and other trans-Neptunian objects out there, and at these distances it could take thousands or even millions of Earth years to orbit the Sun and most of them will never journey towards the inner solar system. However, occasionally gravitational perturbations from other celestial objects will fling one or more of these cometary bodies towards the inner solar system, and that's where they pose a potential threat to the Earth. NASA's WISE spacecraft has been scanning the entire sky at infrared wavelengths, delivering new insights about these distant wanderers. That data has told scientists that there are at least seven times more of these long-period comets a kilometre or larger in size than previously thought. They've also concluded that these long-period comets are on average at least twice as large as the Jupiter family comets, those whose orbits are shaped by the gravity of Jupiter and have periods of less than 20 years. The WISE observations indicate that over a period of just eight months, between three and five times as many long-period comets pass by the Sun than what had been predicted. The study's lead author, Professor James Bauer from the University of Maryland, says the sheer number of comets being identified speaks to the amount of material left over from the solar system's formation. Bauer says the new observations mean there are far more relatively large chunks of ancient material coming from the Oort cloud than previously thought. Now, if it really exists, the Oort cloud would be far too distant and sparsely populated to be seen by current telescopes the density of comets within it would be low, so the odds of comets actually colliding within it are fairly rare. That's why seeing as many comets as we are seeing says volumes as to the amount of comets that must be out there. The long-period comets that WISE has observed probably got kicked out of the Oort cloud millions of years ago. The observations were carried out during the spacecraft's primary mission before it was renamed NEOWISE and reactivated to target near-Earth objects or NEOs, asteroids and comets which pose a significant threat to the Earth. 
Study co-author and principal investigator for the NEOWISE mission, Amy Mainzer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the new study provides a rare look at objects perturbed out of the Oort cloud. She says these objects are the most pristine examples of what the solar system was like when it formed. Astronomers already had fairly broad estimates of how many long period and Jupiter family comets are in the solar system, but they had no good way of measuring the sizes of long period comets. That's because a comet has a coma, a cloud of gas and dust that appears hazy in images and obscures the cometary nucleus. But by using the WISE data, which shows the infrared glow of this coma, scientists were able to subtract the coma from the overall comet and therefore estimate the nuclear sizes of these bodies. The data is based on 2010 WISE observations of 95 Jupiter family comets and 56 long period comets. The results reinforce the idea that comets which pass the Sun more often tend to be a lot smaller than those spending more time away from the Sun. That's because Jupiter family comets tend to be heated more. That's because they get closer to the Sun where it's warmer, and that causes their more volatile materials such as water to sublimate, in the process dragging away other material from the comet's surface. The new results confirm an evolutionary difference between Jupiter family and long period comets. The existence of so many more long period comets than what's predicted suggests there must have been many more of them out there that are likely to have impacted planets, in the process delivering icy materials from the outer reaches of the solar system. Researchers also found clustering in the orbits of the long period comets they studied. And that suggests there could have been larger bodies which broke apart to form these groups. The results are important for assessing the likelihood of comets impacting not just other planets in the solar system, more importantly, the likelihood of them impacting the Earth. You see, comets travel much faster than asteroids, and we now know they often have much higher masses. And basic physics tells us that mass times acceleration equals force. The new findings will therefore help scientists better understand the kinds of danger long-period comets may pose. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Now they think uh, some comets are bigger than we originally thought. That's scary in itself and we'll need Bruce Willis yet again. And there are more of them. How so? So, yes, new observations by uh, uh, actually an infrared satellite, a, a NASA spacecraft, which has the rather elegant name of WISE. Basically, it's a, an infrared space telescope. And by infrared, we mean telescope that looks at light that is redder than red, which is really heat radiation. So the great thing about the WISE spacecraft is that it can look at the whole sky. So it is very much a survey explorer, one that surveys its vicinity and counts the numbers of objects, or at least you do by computer when that's all returned back to Earth. And what they've done is they've measured more comets than they expected to. Mm. Why can you see comets with infrared? Well, comets actually show up quite well in the infrared, even though they are cold, icy bodies. Uh, a comet nucleus, which is the bit that sort of moves in orbit, is a few kilometres across. It's basically like a flying snowdrift with a lot of muck and dirt in it, which is the raw material from which our solar system was built 4.6 billion years ago. They actually are able to see these things very well with WISE. It's tuned perfectly to this kind of object. And what the scientists, once again from the United States, have discovered is that there are about seven Seven times as many comets over about a kilometre across. And these are what are called long period comets, and I'll explain that in a minute. There are about seven times as many of them as we thought there were. And that's the, oh, the, great, the, <laughs> the great value of, of a survey instrument because it lets you count how many things there are. Yeah. And, well, we now know there's this seven times more. So a long period comet, the period is the length of time it takes to go all the way around the sun. And we call anything that takes less than 200 years a short period comet. Like Halley's. So, yeah, Halley is a short period comet, that's right. So once every 76 years. So once every 200 years is the distinction between long period and short period. The long period comets are ones that we believe come from this hypothetical cloud of comets which exists way, way out in the depths of the solar system. The distance is such that you can actually measure it in terms of the fraction of a light year oh, uh, to the to the edge of the Oort cloud. It was, it's called that because it was 
was proposed back in, I think, 1950 by Jan Oort, a great Dutch astronomer. And he said, well, you know, where do comets come from? Comets that come in with uh, orbits that are so stretched out, they must be coming from a very long way away. And he postulated the existence of the cloud, and that is still the accepted theory for where comets come from. Well, well Fred, he ought to know. Oh, you ought to know. That's right. Oh, boom, boom. <laughs> Someone had to say it. <laughs> I think you ought not to have said it, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the Oort cloud, the source of long-period comets. So what we think happens is that there's this shell of comets around the sun at this very great distance, best part of a light year or half a light year, something like that. And as the sun goes around in its orbit around the centre of the, the galaxy, that cloud is disturbed slightly and that makes comets plummet in towards the inner solar system. So they appear as a long-period comet. And then we believe they are often dynamically affected by the mass of Jupiter. Jupiter's a very massive object. Mm. And so Jupiter tends to pull them into a much shorter period. And that's where how we think the short period comets come about. So Jupiter's influence in all this is very, very significant. But the new bit of this story, is, as I've said, it's the fact that the long period comets seem to exist in much larger numbers than we thought. And they're bigger as well. They are more than a kilometre or so across. We used to think they were rather smaller than that. Planet um, killers. Well, they could be. They, they they could be ocean builders because one theory about where the oceans on the Earth came from is from bombardment by comets mm. in the Earth's early history. Could be. So, yeah. So you say there are seven times more of these than we thought. Seven times how much? Uh, <laughs> yes, seven times a few. Um, <laughs> look, it's, that is essentially the surprise of this research. I can bring up the paper, actually. That, mm. uh, well, if it's seven times 100, 700, that sounds manageable. But if there's like a million of them that we know of, <laughs> yeah, seven well, times as many. OK, all right, here we are. Over the course of the eight months of the survey, our results indicate that the number of long period comets passing within 1.5 AU, that's one and a half times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, are a factor of several higher than previous estimates, while what they call Jupiter comets, which are typically 20 year orbits, are within the previous range of estimates of a few thousand down to sizes near 1.3 kilometres in diameter. In other words, the Jupiter ones fit the bill, mm. but the long period ones don't. Well, let's just pretend it's one and then we're all happy. Um, just a footnote to that that I didn't mention earlier, and that is that one reason why Jan Oort postulated that there's this kind of spherical cloud of comets around the sun is that when we see long period comets, these ones that seem to come from nowhere and then disappear again, you know, with a period of 106,000 years or something like that, when you see comets like that, they come in from all angles. They're not just in the sort of plane of the solar system. They come in from high angles, low angles, everywhere. Yeah. And so that suggests that their source, the reservoir from which these things come, is actually a spherical cloud. Mm. Uh, and that's uh, what we still believe today, as I said, postulated by Jan Oort back in uh, about 1950. That's Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims that tremendous amounts of soot lofted into the air from global wildfires following the asteroid impact which wiped out all the non-avian dinosaurs would have plunged the Earth into darkness for nearly two years. The findings, reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, indicates the fires and ejected debris from the impact 66 million years ago caused an impact winter scenario. It would have shut down photosynthesis, as well as drastically cooling the planet, dramatically changing climate, and further contributing to the mass extinction event which wiped out 75% of all life on Earth and bringing an end to the age of dinosaurs. 
The study, led by the United States National Center for Atmospheric Research with support from NASA and the University of Colorado Boulder, used computer modeling to show how Earth's conditions may have looked at the end of the Cretaceous period. The new simulations will help paleobiologists better understand why most species died, especially in the oceans, while others survived. Scientists estimate that more than three-quarters of all species on Earth disappeared at the boundary of the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods, an event known as the KPG extinction. Now, that's a new geologic term for what was formerly called the Cretaceous Tertiary, or KT, boundary event. The evidence shows that the extinction occurred at the same time that a large asteroid between 10 and 15 kilometres wide slammed into what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. As well as the initial shockwave blast, the collision triggered massive earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanic eruptions. The entire planet would have rung like a bell. Scientists also calculate that the force of the impact would have launched vaporised rock high above Earth's surface, where it would have condensed into small particles known as spherules. As the spherules fell back to Earth, they would have been heated by atmospheric friction to temperatures high enough to spark global wildfires, broiling the Earth's surface. In fact, a thin layer of spherules can be found worldwide in the geologic record. The study's lead author, Charles Bardeen, says the extinction of many of the large animals on land would have been caused by the immediate aftermath of the impact. But animals that lived in the oceans, or those that could burrow underground or slip underwater temporarily, could have survived. The new study picks up the story after the initial effects, that is, after the impact, the earthquakes, the tsunamis and the broiling. But Ian and colleagues wanted to look at the long-term consequences of the amount of soot likely created and what those consequences may have been for the animals that were left. In past studies, researchers have estimated the amount of soot that might have been produced by global wildfires by measuring the soot deposits still preserved in the geologic record. For the new studies, the authors used what's known as the Community Earth System Model to simulate the effects of soot on global climate going forward. They used the most recent estimates for the amount of soot and particulate matter found in layers of rock left after the impact, some 15,000 million tonnes, as well as both larger and smaller amounts to quantify the climate sensitivity to more or less extensive fires. The simulations showed that soot heated by the sun was lofted higher and higher into the atmosphere, eventually forming a global barrier that blocked the vast majority of sunlight from reaching the Earth's surface. At first, this would have meant that no matter where you were on Earth, 12 noon would have appeared as dark as a moonlit night. While eventually the skies would have gradually brightened, the simulations indicate that photosynthesis would have been impossible for well over a year and a half. And because many of the plants on land would have already been incinerated by the fires, the darkness would likely have had its greatest impact on phytoplankton, which underpins the ocean food chain. The loss of these tiny organisms would have had a ripple effect through the oceans, eventually devastating many species of marine life. The authors also found that photosynthesis would have been blocked even at much lower levels of soot. For example, in one simulation, using only 5,000 million tonnes of soot, just a third of the best estimate from the measurements, photosynthesis would still have been impossible for over a year. In the simulations, the loss of sunlight caused a steep decline in average global surface temperatures, with an average drop of 28 degrees Celsius over land and 11 degrees Celsius over the oceans. While the Earth's surface cooled in the study scenarios, the atmosphere higher up in the stratosphere actually became much warmer because of all the soot there absorbing energy from the sun. In fact, stratospheric temperatures could have reached more than 200 degrees Celsius, twice the boiling point of water. The warmer temperatures caused ozone destruction and also allowed for large quantities of water vapour to be stored in the upper atmosphere. It simply never got the chance to cool down enough to condense into rain something we still see today on the planet Venus with its runaway greenhouse effect. The water vapour in Earth's atmosphere would also chemically react in the stratosphere to produce hydrogen compounds that would have led to further ozone destruction. The resulting ozone loss would have meant damaging doses of ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth's surface. Surprisingly, the large reservoir of water in the upper atmosphere formed in the simulations also caused the layer of sunlight blocking soot to be removed abruptly after lingering for years. As the soot began to settle out of the stratosphere, the air began to cool. This cooling in turn caused water vapour to condense into ice particles, which washed even more of the soot out of the atmosphere. As a result of this feedback loop, the cooling causing precipitation that caused more cooling, the thinning soot layer disappeared in just a few months. 
While scientists think this new study gives a robust picture of how large injections of soot in the atmosphere can affect climate, they also caution that the study does have limitations. For example, the simulations were run using a model of the modern-day Earth, not a model representing what the Earth would have been like during the Cretaceous, when the continents were in different locations. Also, the atmosphere 66 million years ago contained different concentrations of gases, including far higher levels of carbon dioxide. Although, thanks to global warming by man-made greenhouse gases, we're heading back in that direction now. Additionally, the simulations didn't try to account for the volcanic eruptions from the Deccan Traps, which were triggered by the asteroid impact. Nor did it account for the sulphur released from the Earth's crust at the site of the asteroid impact, which resulted in an increase in light-reflecting sulphate aerosols in the atmosphere, followed by intense acid rains. Mind you, the data obtained in these new simulations have lots of uses in areas far beyond that of asteroid impact studies. As well as modelling the effects of an impact winter from asteroids, the models are also providing scientists with a preview of what a nuclear winter would likely bring following a major nuclear war. Like global wildfires millions of years ago, the detonation of thermonuclear weapons will also inject huge amounts of soot into the atmosphere, which will also lead to a temporary global cooling. However, Bardeen says the amount of soot created by nuclear warfare would be much less than what was created during the KPG boundary event. But the soot would still affect climate in similar ways, cooling the surface and heating the upper atmosphere with potentially equally devastating effects. And of course then there's the massive issue of radiation from all that nuclear fallout. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, has successfully launched an H-2A rocket carrying a new Japanese navigation system satellite. The H-2A F-35 mission blasted off under clear blue skies from the Tanegashima Space Center south of Tokyo. On board was the quasi-Zenith satellite system spacecraft Mikabiki-3, heading into geostationary transfer orbit. The launch vehicle was equipped with four strap-on solid rocket boosters for this flight, as the new satellite's 4,700 kg mass was some 700 kg heavier than previous quasi-Zenith satellite system spacecraft. The SRBs burnt out 115 seconds after launch, and were jettisoned in two pairs of two. Payload fairing separation and jettison occurred 3 minutes and 45 seconds into the flight, followed by core stage managing cutoff, or MECO, 6 minutes and 38 seconds after launch. Following first aid separation, the H-2A's upper stage then ignited for the first of two engine burns. The first burn, lasting 4 minutes and 31 seconds, placed the spacecraft into a preliminary parking orbit. This was followed by a 12 minute and 16 second coasting phase to get the spacecraft into the right position before a 4 minute 10 second additional engine burn to insert the satellite into its geostationary transfer orbit. The four-satellite quasi-Zenith satellite system Constellation will provide navigation signals comparable with the American Global Positioning Satellite System GPS. The improved coverage is designed to increase services in Japanese city environments where tall buildings often block out existing GPS signals. The extra mass on the latest satellite is due to the installation of two additional transponders for Japan's S-band emergency civil defence broadcasts. The launch was the fourth H-2A flight this year, and the fifth overall Japanese launch for 2017. Back in January, JAXA unsuccessfully attempted to place the Tricom-1 satellite into orbit using a modified SS-520 sounding rocket. Tokyo's next launch is slated for October, when another H-2A will carry the final quasi-Zenith satellite system spacecraft into orbit. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. And a new study reported in the European Journal of Neuroscience could help herald a new tool that identifies a subgroup of people with autism spectrum disorders. The test, which consists of measuring rapid eye movements, may indicate defects in an area of the brain that plays an important role in emotional and social development. Autism spectrum disorders are characterised by a wide range of symptoms that can vary in severity from person to person. 
This unpredictability not only presents a challenge for diagnosis, but also the best course for treatment. Identifying the specific phenotype of the disorder is therefore an essential first step in providing effective care. The potential relevance of eye movement in individuals with autism is the area of the brain that controls these actions, a densely packed structure of neurons known as the cerebellum. Traditionally considered to play a role in motor control, the cerebellum is now known to be essential to emotion and cognition through its connections to the rest of the brain. There's growing evidence that the structure of the cerebellum is altered in a subpopulation of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. A new study warns that the melting greenhouse ice sheet could accelerate the rise in sea levels more than expected. Scientists at Bristol University say the warmer conditions are encouraging increased algal growth, which in turn is darkening the surface. This darker ice is absorbing more solar radiation than clean white ice and so warms up and melts more rapidly. A five-year British research project called Black and Bloom is studying different algal species and their likely impact on sea level increases due to global warming. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet due to man-made climate change is already adding almost a millimetre a year to global increases in sea levels. Greenland is the largest mass of ice in the Northern Hemisphere, covering an area about seven times the size of the United Kingdom and reaching up to three kilometres thick. Were Greenland's ice sheets to melt completely, they would increase global sea levels by up to seven metres or 20 feet. A new study shows that USB connections, the most common interface used globally to connect external devices to computers, are extremely vulnerable to information leakage, making them even less secure than previously thought. The study by scientists at the University of Adelaide tested more than 50 computers and external USB hubs, finding over 90% leaked information to an external USB device. USB connected devices include keyboards, card swipes and fingerprint readers, which often send sensitive information to the computer. It was previously thought that because that information is only being sent along a direct communication path to the computer, it's protected from potentially compromised devices. But the new study shows that if a malicious device is plugged into an adjacent port on the same USB hub, this sensitive information can be captured. And that means keystrokes showing passwords or other private information can easily be stolen. It happens because voltage fluctuations in USB port data lines can be monitored from adjacent ports on the same USB hub. To test their theory, scientists used a modified cheap novelty plug-in lamp with a USB connector. They were able to successfully read every keystroke from an adjacent keyboard USB interface. The data was then sent via Bluetooth to a separate computer. The main take-home message from the study is that you shouldn't connect anything to a USB unless you can fully trust it. And for users, that means don't connect to other people's devices. The discovery of the remains of a majestic female statue at an archaeological dig in Turkey is challenging science's understanding of the public role of women in the ancient world. The excavations, led by University of Toronto archaeologists near the Syrian border, have unearthed a beautifully carved head and upper torso of a female figure. The basalt statue is largely intact, although the face and chest appears to have been intentionally, possibly ritually, defaced in antiquity. The remnants measure over a metre in height, suggesting the original statue would have been up to five metres tall. The statue was found within the gate complex that would have provided access to the upper citadel of Kunula, the capital of the Iron Age Neo-Hittite kingdom of Patina some 3,000 years ago. The statue features rings of curls that protrude from beneath a shawl that covers her head, shoulders and back. It was found face down in a thick bed of stone chips that included shard-like fragments of her eyes, nose and face, as well as fragments of sculptures previously found elsewhere within the gate complex, including the head of the Neo-Hittite king Saplaluma, discovered in 2012. Saplaluma, who ruled in the early 9th century BCE, was named after a famed Bronze Age Hittite warrior. He challenged the then-dominant Egyptian empire for control of the lands between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates River. The identity of the female figure has not yet been determined, but it's thought to be Capapius, the divine mother of the gods of ancient Anatolia. Two inscribed monuments carved in the ancient language of the Hittites found in Syria more than 50 years ago provide a description of Capapius, the only named female known from the region in the early part of the first millennium BCE. She lived for more than 100 years and appears to have been a prominent matriarchal figure. The discovery of this statue raises the possibility that women played a far more prominent role in the political and religious lives of these early Iron Age communities. 
the presence of lions, sphinxes and colossal human statues in the citadel gateways of the Neo-Hittite royal cities of the Iron Age Syrio-Anatolia continue to Bronze Age Hittite tradition, which were boundaries legitimising the power and authority of the ruling elite over their subjects. The gateway complex appears to have been destroyed following the Assyrian conquest of the site in 738 BCE, when the area was paved over and converted into the central courtyard of an Assyrian sacred precinct. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association has found that even a small reduction in childhood measles vaccinations would produce disproportionately large increases in the number of measles cases and related public health costs. Scientists found just a 5% drop in the number of children inoculated against the measles, mumps and rubella would triple the number of annual measles cases. The MMR vaccine is an inoculation against the three diseases. The additional measles cases would increase annual public health expenditure by at least $2.1 million. That's some $20,000 per case of measles. The study is seen as a wake-up call for what can be expected in coming months and years because of ongoing misinformed campaigns by the anti-vax scare groups. A threshold of 90-95% to vaccine coverage is needed to prevent measles outbreaks. The new study is predicting a sharp increase in measles cases because of declines in vaccination. Previous studies have found that unvaccinated people tended to cluster in certain geographic areas and introducing measles into these areas causes significant outbreaks. Just such outbreaks took place in 2014 when 383 measles cases occurred in unvaccinated Amish communities in Ohio and more recently last year among undervaccinated communities of Somali immigrants in Minnesota. And that's a good segue for a skeptic's view on vaccines. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. Science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's just a great steaming pile of woo. That's what scepticism's all about. A search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. Today we're looking at the science of vaccines and the anti-vax movement. One of the poster boys for the global anti-vaccination movement is Andrew Wakefield. He used to be Dr. Andrew Wakefield, but was struck off the medical register after being found guilty of being dishonest, irresponsible and misleading in a study reported in the highly respected Lancet Medical Journal in 1998, falsely linking the childhood measles, mumps and rubella vaccine to autism. At the time, the sensational claim generated massive media coverage and was immediately picked up by anti-vaccination groups, the so-called anti-vaxxers. However, it soon became apparent that there were numerous serious issues with Wakefield's study. Firstly, Wakefield only examined 12 kids, while other subsequent studies looking at many thousands of kids have been unable to replicate his findings and, in fact, have seriously challenged his results. Apart from the dubious nature of the findings themselves, Wakefield's research methods and protocols regarding a link between vaccines and autism were also found to be faulty. He and two fellow researchers were therefore brought up before the UK's General Medical Council. The panel heard evidence for 148 days over two and a half years. Then, after 45 days of deliberation, the panel found Wakefield's conduct in relation to his research and the presentation of the paper to The Lancet was dishonest, irresponsible and resulted in a misleading description of the patient population in The Lancet paper. The council found that Wakefield deliberately omitted necessary and relevant information and he failed to disclose several important conflicts of interest, including the fact that he was in the process of patenting his own rival vaccine something worth taking into account when considering his current stand against vaccination. The General Medical Council panel concluded that Wakefield's behaviour supported findings of serious professional misconduct. Accordingly, in 2010, the panel determined that Wakefield's name should be erased from the medical register. Shortly afterwards, The Lancet formally retracted the study, saying that following the judgment of the UK General Medical Council's Fitness to Practice panel, it had become clear that several elements of the paper by Wakefoot et al. were inaccurate. Despite the fact that he was working on his own rival vaccine, the anti-vaccination movement are describing Wakefoot as a martyr to the cause. Despite the overwhelming evidence destroying the claims of the anti-vax movement, its propaganda film Vaxed continues to do the rounds, including screenings in Australia. Freedom of speech is important, but so too is a legal system which criminally prosecutes those whose actions cause harm to others by publishing information known to be false. 
That's why it's illegal to yell fire in a crowded theatre. Now one of the promoters of the anti-vax movement, who bills himself as the world's number one anti-vaxxer, is planning a lecture tour of Australia in December. He too deserves freedom of speech. But he should also be held responsible for any non-vaccinated child who dies or becomes seriously ill as a direct result of the advice he gives. Meanwhile, in a separate matter, health authorities have now confirmed a third case of measles in a student from the Perth Waldorf School, which has a notoriously low rate of vaccinations. Free on-site vaccinations have now been given to students, and the school's principal has resigned as it was revealed that he stood as a candidate for the 2014 Victorian state elections on an anti-vaccination platform. To look at the bigger picture of vaccinations and the problems caused by anti-vaxxers is Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics. Vaccines are biological compounds that induce immunity to a specific pathogen, usually it's a virus or a bacteria. They protect against many common and very serious childhood illnesses that in the past you killed millions of children, and even today they still do in parts of the third world. Currently in Australia, the early childhood vaccination schedule covers 14 diseases, and they're given over the mostly around the first 18 months. The important thing to know about vaccines is that they do not just protect the child who gets the vaccines. Uh, one of the important effects of vaccination is what's called herd immunity, although I prefer the term community immunity. And what happens is beyond a certain level of vaccination in a community, the pathogen, the virus, the bacteria, can't take hold. And that means people being vaccinated protect those around them who are not vaccinated. So there are people who, for example, cannot be vaccinated because they're either too young or they're ill or they could be immunocompromised. For example, they could be receiving chemotherapy or something like that. And they can't be individually protected, but they're protected by the community around them. The first vaccine was developed in 1798, and the groups and individuals opposing vaccines emerged almost immediately. So before 1800, we already had an anti-vax movement. And their arguments developed over the years, along with science, but they've never actually been able to mount a real scientific argument against vaccines because there really isn't one. What are some of these arguments? The basic argument is that hygiene is what led to the decline in deaths and not the vaccines. This is actually partially true in the sense that some infections have dropped with better hygiene especially we're talking about things like cholera, for example, and other diseases that are not airborne. However, the incidence of the disease has dropped a little bit, but not as significantly as when vaccines were introduced. What about things like measles? Measles is airborne, and not only that, it is extremely infectious. In fact, if you're in touch with a person who has measles, there's a 90% chance you're not immunized. There's a 90% chance that you will catch the disease. It is extremely infectious and no effect at all uh, for hygiene. Another argument is that vaccines are not 100% safe. Again, This is actually true. The thing is, it is impossible to achieve 100% safety in any medical intervention. However, the risk of not vaccinating is significantly higher than the risk from vaccines. Assessment of the risk versus the benefit is always part of the decision uh, when it comes to any medical intervention. And there's no doubt at all, uh, based on all the evidence, that vaccines are significantly more safe and more effective than not vaccinating. What about the argument that vaccines aren't 100% effective anyway? Well, it is actually true that they're not. Again, the argument is never made that they are. Uh, One of the reasons that we need herd immunity is because vaccines are not 100% effective. For example, the measles vaccine is about 95% effective. However, whooping cough vaccines are more like 85% effective, which means that of all those people receiving the vaccine, about 15% will still be uh, immunocompromised in terms of being able to catch the uh, uh, whooping cough. Although chances are that they will not catch it with the same severity as somebody who's never been exposed to the vaccine. Vaccines contain a very specific and very small number of antigens. Antigens are the the things that cause the immune system to react. Anybody who's ever had a child knows that children put things in their mouths and they're exposed to a lot of different things all the time. In fact, an average child, not a particularly dirty child, not in a a, a hygienic environment, will be exposed typically to dozens or hundreds of antigens every day. I used to love sharing ice cream with a dog, apparently. Absolutely. Well, that's what children do. Children are exposed to hundreds of antigens every day. The amount amount of antigens that they're exposed to through the vaccine program is minuscule as compared to what they're exposed to naturally. Now, one of the other arguments that the anti-vaxxers have concerns the actual testing of vaccines themselves. I would have thought that testing standards would be incredibly high, would have been incredibly difficult to get anything through the Therapeutic and Drug Administration. That is true. The thing is, the arguments are not meant to make sense. They're meant to attack vaccines. So the argument generally that anti-vaxxers make
make around vaccines is they're not tested using what is considered the gold standard in these kind of tests, in clinical tests, which is the randomized control trials. In randomized control trials, you give some of the people in the study, you give them the medication, and another group of people, you give placebo. The thing is, with what we know about vaccines now in terms of effectiveness and safety, it would be completely unethical to give placebo to part of a group of children. So it is, we no longer do placebo-controlled trials for vaccines. However, what we do is we test them for safety. The vaccines are tested for safety in the small groups and then in larger groups to make sure that they do not affect children in a way that would endanger them. And then there's a lot of tracking done after the fact in order to make sure that the vaccines actually have their effect, both in terms of safety and effectiveness. And it's important to note that no anti-vaxxer ever discovered that the vaccine was unsafe. However, doctors regularly pull vaccines out of the market if they have any even minor suspicion that a vaccine could be unsafe. And there was an example of this a few years ago in Perth where several children from the flu vaccine got high temperature. Again, it was not particularly dangerous, but some children had febrile convulsions, which are very scary for the parents and not particularly good for the child. I had my child had that as a child when they were younger as well. It's very scary, not particularly dangerous, but the vaccine was pulled from the market. That's what happens when science works. From what I hear, a lot of childhood diseases are just that. They're not that serious to the sort of things kids are meant to get anyway. That is a claim that, of course, is made by anti-vaxxers, but it's not true. Uh, Probably the prime example of this, I mean, we can always mention uh, things like polio and there's other diseases that I don't think anybody would claim are not serious. Uh, Whooping cough is a terrible, terrible, terrible disease that leaves kids maimed. And we have children die in Australia, mostly in communities where children are not protected by herd immunity. I think there was an issue on the central coast of New South Wales not all that long ago. Yeah, so uh, yes, in Gosford, there's a patch of low vaccination. There's obviously the northern rivers area of New South Wales around uh, Barn Bay. What happens there is that the vaccination rates are low and children are more exposed there. And there have been deaths in those communities. So obviously, whooping cough is terrible. But even things like measles, people think that measles is just a bit of a rash, but it's not. Measles can lead to terrible injury, and uh, sometimes that injury can happen many years later. It causes encephalitis, it causes brain injury, it can cause death. And in fact, just to give you an idea, in the year 2000, the World Health Organization decided to go on a, a worldwide measles vaccination campaign, especially in Asia and Africa, because at that time, 750,000 children were dying every year from measles. This is in 2000. By 2007, through a concerted effort, they've managed to reduce that number by two-thirds to about 230,000. So again, what I want to emphasize here is that even after they've done that, even after all this huge effort, coordinated effort across the world, still every year, 230,000 children were dying from measles. This is not a mild disease by any stretch. Even today, after further work, 10 years on from this uh, milestone of of reducing death by two-thirds, more than 100,000 children die every year from measles. One of the big ones right now is cases of meningitis springing up around Australia at the moment because of a lack of vaccination. Well, it is not hugely common, thankfully, but it is a terrible disease. When a child catches it, it's first of all... news every time they, it happens. Absolutely, because children die. Because it's a really deadly disease. The, the rate of injury and death is significant, is significant and it's just a terrible disease and anybody who chooses not to protect their children against it is just making a very big mistake. Fatal mistake often. Yeah, often a fatal mistake, absolutely. One of the big issues that concern people who are opposed to vaccination uh, are things like the chemicals contained in these vaccines, especially mercury. Yes, well, they they mention all kinds of uh, ingredients that are contained in vaccine. And again, there's a, there's a kernel of truth in some of these claims, but some ingredients are actually included in vaccines. They are in such small quantities that they're not poisonous. I'll give you an example. The maximum quantity of formaldehyde in vaccines. So people are really worried about formaldehyde because, you know, formaldehyde is what you put dead bodies in to preserve them. So obviously, anti vaxxers very often comment on formaldehyde. The thing is that the maximum quantity of formaldehyde in vaccines injected in a single day is 50 times smaller than the amount of formaldehyde naturally occurring in the baby's body. And it's actually less than the amount in a single apple. Aluminium is also used in vaccines. It's actually used as something called an adjuvant. It's meant to increase the immune system's response. The thing is, the amount of aluminium used in vaccines is significantly smaller than what you're exposed to in normal, safe, and environmental exposure. So these ingredients 
are there, but they're in such small quantities that they're not harmful. What about mercury? First of all, mercury used to be true. It's very, really less common now. However, the fact that it's less common now is not really the important point. The ingredient in vaccines that contain mercury was called thimerosal. Thimerosal is a mercury-containing compound that was used basically as an antiseptic to make sure that the vaccine does not... Um, it's a preservative. Yeah, it's a preservative, yeah. Thimerosal is basically a mercury-containing preservative. It is used in very, very small quantities, but more importantly, it is designed specifically to be the kind of mercury that is not accumulated in the body. It is broken in the body into ethyl mercury and it is just dispersed through the urine very, very quickly and therefore never gets to the point where it accumulates. So even when it did exist in vaccines, it didn't really accumulate in the body. We know that mercury, for example, accumulates in fish and other seafood and can cause brain damage. The mercury that's contained in fish and other food is something called methyl mercury, which is something that does accumulate in the body is biologically available for the body and is retained in the body, not the ethyl mercury, which is what's included in vaccines and is dispersed by the body's cleanup mechanisms quite naturally. Aren't they so replacing mercury say, now as preservatives in many vaccines? So Marathol was removed from most vaccines back in the early 2000s. So it's, yeah. been, it's been almost 20 years now that it's very rare. So Marathol is still included in some flu vaccines, but even then, for people who don't want it, there, there are thimerosal free vaccines. Again, I would not hesitate to take a vaccine with thimerosal, but for those who want a vaccine without thimerosal, it is available. But the thing is, with these vaccine disinformation groups, they still maintain mercury's there. They, they still claim that a lot of these chemicals, which they like to talk about, a lot of the heavy metals and that, they're still a problem. And even if they know they're not an issue, they're still talking about them as if they're still there and still pose a threat. And that is part of the game. They are against vaccines. The arguments will shift. The position will not. So, for example, you've probably heard the claim, probably the biggest claim against vaccines is that they cause autism. Oh, yeah, the Andrew Wakefield uh, claim. Yeah. Yes, the thing is that it used to be that vaccines cause autism because of mercury, but it's been 17 years since mercury was removed from vaccines. Now the claim instead is that something else, it's the vaccine load, it's all kinds of other things, and so formaldehyde that causes it. The goalpost keeps shifting, the arguments keep changing, and in the end it's always, there's always something wrong with vaccines. Exactly what it is doesn't really matter. The whole issue of vaccination is still one full of controversy. Of course, we've seen the no-jab, yeah. no-pay legislation legislation being introduced by governments around Australia because of the uh, publicity and success the anti-vaxxers have had and, and it's even filtered through to universities. Was it last year that you guys gave the Bent Spoon Award to the University of Wollongong? Tell us about that. Yeah, so the University of Wollongong awarded a PhD in vaccination policy to a an anti-vaxxer. That PhD was clearly flawed. The process around it was clearly flawed in the sense that this is a scientific area and the people who assessed the, the PhD were not scientists to be awarded this kind of PhD. That, that is completely flawed and we awarded them with the Ben Spoon Award, which is our award for the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. The PhD was awarded in the Department of Social Sciences and uh, therefore the people who assessed it were social scientists and of course that is completely inappropriate and that is the reason that the University of Wollongong was awarded with a, with a Ben Spoon. How do you fight this huge conspiracy theory around vaccines? To simply expose their arguments as fallacious and tell people to not take their cues from me or from you or from non-government organizations that present themselves as a World Vaccine Watchdog. Simply go to their doctors, go to their GPs and get the best advice. That's Aran Segev, President of Australian Skeptics. And you're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram... 
And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Cast. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.